So we are here for the breakout session on microbiome diversity in human health. And my name is Archita. I'm a lab head in Australia, and I am working on um, understanding early life microbiome and its impact on immunity. And uh, my colleague here. As you can see, I work on skin. I work on gut. I I am a computational biologist, and it's my first HCA meeting. So we we actually in our lab we started working on skin microbiome. Uh, which is a very uh, understudied organ and we are studying the uh, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, all those kinds of autoimmune skin diseases and to find the self-trigger. It's like the host microbiome association kind of thing and we are now moving from association to interaction and we have also started off late working in a big uh, consortium projects on maternal and child health in India where we study preterm birth, we study stunting, wasting, and there we study the maternal microbiome and also the gut microbiome of children. Yeah, so as you can see, Shovik has already taken all the tags and all the areas to work on. Um, but is my, is my voice echoing? Maybe I'll just go back. Um, hello to all the, um, all the attendees who are joining online. Um, I can't see the... Is there a way to have a panel where yes, you can see, can see the, see the attendees? attendees? Yeah. I think it should be reading somewhere mode. here. Reading yeah. Mode. Slide reading mode. This yes, one? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, no, Did sorry. Like, uh, but do we see the attendees? No. So what we can do here when we start, so there is no agenda. There is no fixed agenda how we will go along. Uh, it's like a panel kind of discussion. What we can do, we can now briefly introduce ourselves. So we know that who are there in this room. And also uh, slowly when we can see the uh, you know, online participants also from different parts of India and the world, they can also briefly introduce themselves. So firstly, we can start with the offline uh, participants and they can briefly introduce themselves. Okay, um, so my name is Orjun. I'm at uh, INSTEM. I'm an associate professor there. Uh, I'm also a member of the Pediatric Cell Atlas Project. Uh, I'm from INSTEM in Bangalore. Yeah, okay. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, I work on the lung and uh, okay. yeah, there are some, some questions that we have concerning cellular plasticity, which is based on a host microbe interaction. And that's what brings me to this discussion. Hello, my name is Pritha. I have just submitted my PhD thesis and I'm walking. My, thank you. And my postdoc supervisor is sitting right next to me on my right. And uh, well, I have joined DBT in STEM. So it's a new journey on postdoc. So basically, as um, uh, Sir said, like, um, it's about looking about how micro remodel lung cell. So basically that is going on. Great, welcome. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Yogesh. Uh, I'm a scientist at Child like Health Research Foundation in Bangladesh. Uh, like my work the focuses the on uh, the respiratory uh, surfaces, uh, and I'm specifically looking at like the impact vaccines and other uh, like exposures have on the health on outcomes of children under the age of five. So, Great, thanks. welcome. Yeah. Uh, hello, I am Moushumi Sharkar. Actually, I am a PhD, fifth year PhD student working on the vaginal microbiome in pregnancy outcome. I am from the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. I am a student of Dr. Shovik Mukherjee. Oh, <laughs> hello, I am Piali. I am a third year PhD student from National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. So, actually, I work on the single cell transcriptomics of placenta of the different gestational periods. So I, I have a very little knowledge about the microbiomes and I have attended your talks and it's actually very much interested, gain interested to no, uh, know about more about this. I'm here. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. I am Amlan. So I'm an associate professor in the Royal Global University, Guwahati. Uh, this is in the northeastern part of India. So my interest in microbiome is that I have some microbiology background during my graduation studies. Uh, although I am a cell biologist, uh, but in the Northeast India, the food habitat I have observed, and also it's the correlation with the cancer, that fermented food, fermented areca nuts, 
uh, fermented meat. So they have some unique microbial signature. And my interest is that whether this microbiome profiling, uh, we can utilize this as a prognostic marker for different cancers and also causative or any therapeutic leads can be taken out from this. So this is my one of the primary interest. So why I'm here in this room. Thanks. Great. Did you say areca nut? Yes, it's an areca nut, yeah. uh, then uh, betel quid, uh, tobacco, and also there are lots of fermented meat, fish, food that people used to take there. And that's the, all over the northeastern states. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anaswini. Uh, I've just submitted my PhD thesis. I'm a student at Ames, New Delhi. Uh, my work has primarily been on understanding how the microbiome, the mucosa associated and crypt associated microbiome shifts in patients with ulcerative colitis as compared to controls and how this again uh, refurbishes in response to fecal microbiota transplantation. And I've done both microbiome and metabolomics of these patients in all the three states and now I'm looking at single cell ATAC seq profiles of gut organoids which have been treated with FMT associated metabolites that were identified in our screen. Great. So are you interested in particular age group or uh, is it? Uh, so we've taken adults between the ages of uh, 20 to 50, so an adult population. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Aditya. I'm from Ames, New Delhi. I've also submitted my thesis just now. Uh, my work has been on uh, fecal microbiome in ulcerative colitis and how it uh, changes in response to fecal microbiota transplantation. And I've also worked in gut organoids, uh, treating them with urolithin and other metabolites derived from microbiota and how single cell uh, uh, RNA uh, changes uh, in response to the treatment in gut organoids from patients with ulcerative colitis. Thank you. Great. So we have organoid as well here. Okay, I am Arpadeep Ghosh. Uh, I am finally an undergraduate student at NIT Durgapur. Uh, I, last year I work on gut microbiome, basically on Helicobacter pylori and its pathogenesis. I work under uh, Anindita Onibosu okay. of UC Chicago. That's why she told me to attend this uh, yeah. that seminar. And it is my first time in SCI here. Hello, uh, myself Ankita Madhesha. Uh, I am a PhD student in National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. So I am basically working on role of gut microbiome in early childhood growth failure. So for that, uh, I am basically collecting sample from the infants below six months of age and then characterizing the gut microbiome for them. Nice. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Shankhadeep from CNCI. I am a scientific faculty there. And I have interest on uh, microbiome virome interaction in some of the cancers like uh, gastric cancer, uh, oral cancer or so. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Sumit Rawat. Uh, I am an associate professor at uh, Government Bundelkhan Medical College, Sagar, which is in central India. Uh, I am a principal investigator there at, at, uh, at the um, uh, regional uh, uh, this virology lab. And uh, we are uh, working with few viruses. And apart from that, we are also, uh, we actually had a paper on uh, uh, the microbiome in uh, uh, serious COVID patients versus the asymptomatic people. So, uh, the microbiome we did over there. And the same approach we are applying to uh, the asymptomatic or you can say uh, uh, only the infected people in tuberculosis versus the diseased people. So, those who are actually having just the pathogen, but they are not developing a disease. The latent form. Yeah, the latent TB versus active TB. So, uh, we are working on that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, hi, I'm Triveni. I'm from IIT Delhi. I'm a PhD student in IIT Delhi. So, my work uh, is on how the host pathogen interaction, I mean, an insect uh, pathogen interaction changes uh, in the course of evolution. So, we do in experimental evolution on insects. So my work is more about the insect microbiota. So yeah, I might be yeah, an outlier over here. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think. Yeah. Hello, I am Bisharup from uh, Chitranjan National Cancer Institute. So. So sorry, I, uh, sorry. I'm uh, interested in actually in the gastric microbiota in cancer, uh, but uh, my present interest lies in the how uh, the 
gastric microbiota or particularly it is related with neurological diseases manifestation like if the gut is called the second brain as, as well so in the parkinson's disease or some of the neurological disease whether it has some role and, and it's an outcome with the treatment possibilities thanks great and you are from chitranjan national cancer institute okay thanks thank you uh, hello i am shankho i am dr shobhi pukhati student in nibmg so i am uh, now uh, icmr srf so i am currently doing phd on autoimmune skin diseases mainly focusing on psoriasis and atopic dermatitis and we are trying to figure out the host microbiome interaction in atopic dermatitis and psoriasis to find out the uh, the potential antigen or something or what is the, the main reason behind those autoimmunity or something so this is thank you great thank you so i think we have a diverse audience here are you trying to put zoom here we now had a brief introduction of the offline participants now i will request the online participants to give a brief introduction so that we we can understand uh, you know their expertise first i will ask uh, tarini to uh, introduce himself hello everyone i hope i'm audible so i am tarini so i'm assistant professor in the indrapur institute of information technology triple it delhi so like professor sovik i am also a computational biologist who uses different kinds of data driven techniques to understand the human microbiome so i have worked on uh, various topics in this area like i work uh, so and they basically fall into four themes so one of the primary themes that i work on is the interaction of the gut and the oral microbiome with aging second theme that i work that uh, we have i've started working on is the interaction of diet microbiome and identifying personal uh, determinants of response to different kinds of diet therapies and probiotics uh another uh, thing that i keep i work on is understanding the basic of assembly of different uh, microbes in different body, body sites using public uh, data sets and another uh, the fourth thing that we uh, we work on in our in our lab is to understand the cross microbiome interactions within the human body like interaction primarily the interaction between the oral microbiome and the gut and the gastric microbiome and the gut so we uh, we primarily so use public public data sets mass data sets to do different kinds of analysis and try to identify signals and patterns and recently we have also started uh, building a small uh, wet lab uh, validation facility over here and i have to include also uh, add functional validations of specific strains and isolate isolating specific strains and understanding the functionality in future so that's what some of what i do yeah thank you tarini uh dr rupak hi uh good evening everybody probably i am the only person who is outside of academia because i work at unilever which is unilever industries private limited and i collaborate with shobik and my main area of interest is skin microbiome thank you thank you yeah so uh, our friends from lvpi Yeah, thanks, Ovid. Hi, all. I am Prajesh. I am a retina surgeon. So my chief interest have always been diabetic retinopathy, and now uh, we're trying to look at the gut microbiome as well as the microbiome inside the eye, which is the aqueous fluid microbiome, whether it can serve as a target for therapy and reduce my own work burden. I have with me my colleague, Dr. Arna Sri. Hi, hi, all. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Arna Sri, research scientist working at uh, LB Prasad Eye Institute. uh majorly i work on the ocular surface microbiome uh particularly with respect to dry eye disease i work on uh, different uh, classes of dry eye disease we try to see the change in microbiome in different uh, uh classes of dry eye disease and then compare it whether the changes are same in different classes or categories or is it the uh or is it different for example uh, uh the uh, change in microbiome with respect to the systemic inflammation compared to the only ocular surface inflammation we try to compare and then try to understand the changes in the microbiome so that is what i do and then uh, i have uh, different projects on uh, uh, ocular surface microbiome uh, with respect to the environmental factors changes in environment and then how the microbiome changes on the ocular surface as well as i am also working on the preterm and then uh, postterm uh, 
uh, neonates ocular surface microbiome with respect to the sepsis. And now we have started collaborating okay. with uh, Sovic at NIBMG for a Pan India project which looks at ethnicity adjustments with microbiome. Thank you, thank you, Abhijesh and Anushri. Thank you for joining. Uh, now, my, our, our expert friend from RGCB, Shantanu Da. Uh, yeah, Sh Shantanu, but my name is not showing for some reason. I don't know why. Showing Institute. So, uh, my I am a microbiologist mainly. My interest in microbiome came from the fact that my favorite bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, um, often doesn't show a direct correlation with the infection versus the disease. So we were interested to understand the microbiome uh, of Helicobacter pylori. And um, although several papers, including Dr. Tardini and Dr. Bhavatosh, published papers on gastric microbiome, so we were interested to look into the gut microbiome. And we found that the gut microbiome for Helicobacter positive and what negative is very different. And not only that, the, the uh, those who develop the disease, their gut microbiome typically lacks the good bacteria. Uh, since we came to the microbiome, we started doing other microbiome as well. It means uh, in, in relation to other diseases, but also we are interested in doing more helicobacter research in terms of uh, antimicrobial resistance, genomes, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, another researcher from Switzerland. She is now in midnight. Meghna. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Meghna Swayambhu, and I'm a PhD student at the Zurich Institute of Forensic Medicine. And I am trying to develop tools to bring the microbiome research into forensic applications by looking at body site specificity of bacteria and also individual specificity. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So yeah. Meghna and her PI will also join shortly. Her PI is I think, yes. traveling and she is in a different place. And she will join, I think, in the second breakout session. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Meghna. Thanks for joining at all hours. Shovik and Binay, you can Thank introduce you. yourself briefly. And then we can start. We have a conglomerate of, uh, you know, experts in Hello, this Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Shovik Pal. I am second year PhD student. I am working on host microbiome interaction of diabetic foot ulcer patients in India. So I have poster also there for tomorrow. You can see it. Number? There is no numbering today. Tomorrow will be number. They will give numbers. Yeah, I am doc I'm working under Dr. Shovik Mukherjee. I'm from NIBMG Kalyan. Uh, hello, I'm Vinay More, and I'm also a PhD student from National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. And I work in the field of natural selection uh, to do different environmental variables. Great, natural selection. Welcome. Yes, yeah. evolutionary, evolutionary biology. biology. Evolutionary, yeah. yeah, please. Okay, so hi, I am Sulphi. Sorry. Uh, so uh, I'm a postdoc working at IIT Delhi, and my work basically involves yep. looking at the microbiome changes in uh, acute myeloid leukemia in response to different treatment. That's great. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. So I, are you looking at the, the fecal microbiome? Sorry. We can't hear you. Yeah. So our microbial cells outnumber us. And therefore, in this room, we can see many cancer experts who are coming to the microbiome room and trying to explore. Where is that? Where are they going? I think it can only happen either side or advanced. Yeah, yeah, they cannot manage it actually. Okay, fine. Let's, let's be like this. We need to show slides also. 
Can the zoom be shown, shown here? Okay. So then we can see the slides. I think. Uh, We do it all the time in our own home computers. Why they can't do it, I don't know. Slides and Zoom can go side by side, but they <laughs> can't manage now. Anyway, so uh, let's first start then with the role of microbiome in uh, oncology, cancer. Yeah. It's, it's a very upcoming so. field. It's a very yeah. upcoming field, a very emerging field. And we don't know for the microbiome, it is all, always a caveat that is it a effect or a cause? That we don't know, and by the next generation sequencing and all these kinds of 16S or shotgun analysis, we can only find out the associations. So there is a uh, there, there there is a flag that is microbiome effect or a cause. So that is the reason uh, we have to go to the functional aspect of the microbiome. So the cancer biologists present here, they can actually start the discussion what they think that uh, how they will integrate cancer and microbiome together. So anybody can start the, the discussion. So Shobik, before anybody starts the discussion, I just need to interject. Um, in about five minutes, if you wanted to swap rooms, feel free to swap. You can even continue here because these are two back-to-back -back breakout sessions, but we did it that, this way so that if people wanted to swap rooms, you can. Basically, we are running out of time. So if you want to attend other yeah, yeah, sessions yeah. as well, yeah. True. We had some initial bottleneck due to the online people joining the offline people introduction. So yeah, anybody can, can start. Hello. 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 So uh, just I, I think Dr. Shantanu yes, was, he was saying, uh, this is something maybe a very interesting thing, like the age pallory, of course. Age pallory, I think in Indian population, 70% of the people have age pallory, either asymptomatic or they have some clinical symptoms manifested. Yeah. But how that relates with the other microbiome, like some of the good microbiomes, the probiotics and probiota, actually. And that is actually very intriguing to understand in terms of cancer, because that is what uh, maybe I am also very interested in not only for uh, gastric cancer, but, but other cancers. Yeah. Any part of the body, like the different types of the microbiome, inherent microbiome in the particular uh, its, uh, area. So each, uh, particularly for H. pallor, like there may be some, the, if the H. pallor is predominant, having some uh, these virulent genes expression, that skews the other microorganisms in the gut. And then, like the, what I understand, and in, from the literature also, so there is a relationship like between the opportunistic pathogens coming in, like that, then then actually makes the condition critical or something which is may not be some intrinsic or immunological effect also adding up to it. So that is something maybe uh, yeah. very interesting thing I wish I can. Uh, yeah. We can maybe discuss. Uh, yeah. I cannot hear. Can you hear me? I think the host is disconnected. I think I, yeah. I, I also audible, I guess. same problem. Yeah, now we can hear you. Wow. Yes, yes. Anybody is saying something? Yeah, I heard up to the point that helicobacter can, um, if helicobacter is involved in any other kind of cancer, because it can. Yeah, I think. Would, that you, I would you kindly complete uh, the question so that I can answer? Yeah, because uh, when helicobacter is present, it skews the. Uh, proportion or the population okay, of the this, other this Okay, I, 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 maybe I can attempt an answering that question. Please. Number one, let's, let's don't disagree upon one point that helicobacter alone can cause cancer. So people often talk, I mean, if 50% of the world population is carrying the bacteria, why would you call it as a pathogen? Uh, let's call it as a pathogen because uh, if we consider like that, then Herpes simplex virus is also not a pathogen. H -P uh, hepatitis B virus is not a pathogen because always infection, uh, in number of infected people would be more uh, than the number of number of disease causation. So that's not the point. Point is whether or not it alone can cause disease. It can cause disease because if you infect helicobacter in mice, 
uh, just like Cox postulate. Am I audible, by the way? Yes, yes. Can you? Uh, no, uh, online, uh, offline people also can hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Thanks. So, um, helicobacter can cause um, ulcer and cancer in mouse also and in cell line. So, I would call it as a pathogen. But the human body is more complex because helicobacter maintains a very intricate relationship with the host as well as with the other microbes. Uh, let's quickly mention the host also because without that we cannot uh, understand the disease. Many of the human mutations are, relation, are, are actually involved, uh, makes those people who are having the mutations uh, predisposed to the um, gastric cancer and peptic ulcer. This is number one point. Number two, then the microbiome, which also depends on diet and geography. And typically, we find those areas where we have, um, we have um, what do you call that one, more gastric cancer and peptic ulcer, their helicobacter is different, their virulence genes are different, some of the mutations of the host are different, as well as their dietary patterns are also different, and the microbiome. So true. we believe so, that. So, Shandrunda, we, we have to uh, uh, hear others. So, can you just uh, summarize? We have yeah. much less time. So helicobacter alone is not involved, uh, but it, it, it helicobacter and others together can cause disease. So helicobacter so alone summary, has the capability, that... but typically, what we have found that the bifidobacterium has a protective role for cancer and ulcer. Uh, this is the, okay. from our own finding. Okay, thank you, thank but you. But several, uh, several other bacteria also are involved. Thank you, thank you. Thank uh, you, Shantanu. Yeah. yeah, so if anybody else can speak online, or anybody wants to say anything on this role of microbiome in cancer, please raise your hand. Can you see anybody raising hands? I have one question, so does Shobik, I have one question for the previous speaker. You know, yes, yes. I just want to know that is Helicobacter present in every individual or it is an opportunistic organism that come into your gut? Uh, Rupakda, uh, currently 4.4 .4 billion people are um, infected with Helicobacter pylori. And every 10% uh, of them are having the disease and every year, one million people die because of either gastric cancer and peptic ulcer. That's a, that's so, a... So, okay, so, so as, a, as an healthy individual, if I do a microbiome of my gut, do you think that I will get helicobacter pylori? Yes, yeah, so can we... Uh, yeah, we did that have... study. We often, uh, often, um, what happened is in certain area, uh, in West Bengal, Birbhum, uh, Almost everybody is having the Helicobacter pylori infection, but not the disease. Although they, their guts are highly inflamed, but never they develop the gastric cancer and peptic ulcer. Therefore, other factors are also involved. Okay. Thank you, Shantanu. Okay, thank yeah. You, thank you. So I think because we are studying, like um, uh, talking about uh, cancer microbiome, we should also talk a little bit about tissue types. Yes. Because gut microbiome is one thing which affects everything, but then every cancer is unique. So are there people in audience who are working on certain, and that actually is very important for viruses, people who are interested in viruses. So if you are working in certain tissue type, they might have their indigenous viruses, which just by doing single cell RNA-seq or these kind of techniques, you can identify those viruses, which are virome, part of virome. And um, for bacteria, of course, you have to use different type of techniques. But a little bit about sample type and then what you can do with that. Because in cancer, recently, spatial is being used a lot to look at the microbiome present within tumors. So I think, yeah. The mic to yeah. Yeah. So I don't know much about this field, but I'll ask the question anyway. So I, I saw a multiplexed RNA in situ hybridization of the oral mucosa recently, where it was very clear that there are cells that are infected with multiple uh, microbes at a time. So is there some consensus in this field about how pathogen load at the level of a single cell? can dictate the fate of that cell? 
I think that's, that's a great question here because one thing is, of course, for pathogen we have seen in tuberculosis and all, but also sometimes they are not pathogen. They are just using these cells as a carrier, like they use macrophages, they use a lot of specialized cells. So, yeah, so somebody wants to uh, pitch in into this? Achha, so, I have one observation and I have one question. So, my observation is that I, uh, my area of cancer is uh, esophageal cancer and gastric cancer. So I have very closely observed three, four states of Northeast India for four years. And I have actually also gone through their food habits. So as I have mentioned, the fermented type of food, areca nuts, brittle queen, they are the mainly the people you should intake there. And esophageal cancer, oral cancer, gastric cancer, they're very heavy burden. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is my observation. And also uh, there is a kind of correlation, but it's not very scientifically proven that there are some fermented food taken by the, the particular states where the cancer burden is also very low. Okay. Achha, so my uh, question is that whether uh, in a, achha, again, so we have our research group has uh, some data that we have found that people having a habit of arachna consumption, but they are, don't have any symptoms of cancer, but they have the genetic instability when we examine from their blood. So can this microbiome approach be used as a prognostic marker? Uh, prognosis means, I mean to say, non-invasive. If it is taken from blood or saliva, and there is a, some prediction microbial signature. OK, so this person having a, this particular habit may prone to cancer or may prone to tumor uh, if that person continues with the habit. So that is my uh, question to the expert panel, actually. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that goes on the similar lines of whether a pathogen takes over because you don't have good gut microbiota or whether it's like vice versa. And just by supplementing good gut microbiota, if you can help. And also, I think your next part was that if you can look at the microbiota and predict disease, something like that. So yeah, I think stage is open for that. Yeah, so anybody ha has any comment on this? Uh, Actually, the uh, here I have a comment. Uh, like I have, we have some observations based on some studies uh, that we did uh, in Ireland, like uh, a couple of years ago. So, so there was this uh, different uh, mice. So, at least uh, this is an example from mice that I can cite. So, there were these different mice who were actually given tumor. So, they were like genetically modified mice. They were induced with tumor, and then what we tried to do was we tried to actually incorporate fecal, we did fecal FMT transplantation of these mice, there were like 21 mice, and we did FMT transplantation from individuals at various stages of cancer, like individuals who were like uh, different stages, like healthy individuals, then individuals at different stages of cancer. And at least it, it was a very startling observation that, uh, which actually shows the, the role of the baseline microbiome, that for a certain group of individuals who had the like with uh, from whom we did the FMT who had a very aggressive cancer state we did see a very a large growth of the tumors in the mice but in the other individuals who like in the other spectrum that we had we did see that the tumor growth was very slow so there there was an effect at this uh, this actually we have observations in mice which have actually shown that they like uh, if you do a FMT so their microbiome has a role in the extent that disease progresses in a in an organism, at least. Yeah. So when and the same it? things we have all same thing we have also observed in uh, there was a recent study another example of a recent cohort based study in IPD. So there was this cohort. It, it, it both the studies it had got published in gastroenterology journal. So there was this cohort where they have examined. Groups of IBD patients and they had taken matched fecal samples of IBD patients and their siblings. And these guys, uh, these group, they observed that, first they observed that, okay, the microbiome of the IBD siblings and the IBD patients, they were very similar, even though the sibling didn't have the microbiome, uh, even they didn't have the disease themselves. And they concluded first that microbiome has probably nothing to do with IBD. Couple of years after that, they published another paper where they actually see that the siblings who did have a microbiome similar to the IBD patients, they went on to develop IBD. And based on that, they devised a microbiome risk score of IBD. So these examples actually indicate that the baseline microbiome has a role to play, at least in the progression of some of the diseases. And we do have certain protective microbiota in uh, various body sites. Uh, but the thing is, what these microbiota are and how do they behave 
and their behavior is context dependent and that is why this field is so exciting to study so to summarize i think that you have to complement your human study with animal model study and fecal trans uh, transplants and other kinds of things it can reverse the phenotypes of those kinds of things are more important to you know it is a effect or, or a cause so adding to that we have done a uh, oral cancer microbiome study with imtech uh, chandigarh where we have found its association we have done where we have found in uh, you know cancer patients stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and stage 4 also with those leukoplakia patients pre cancer we have found this a clear uh, you know association and the abundance is significantly in increasing from pre cancer to stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and stage 4 of this capnocytophaga fusobacterium nucleatum and uh, some immunity studies have also been done some immune cells cd4 plus cells and all they have got a good association with this abundance of these bacteria now we are, if we do some animal model study and other kinds of things we will be able to understand but i think it's a clear cut uh, you know clear cut evidence of some functionality because it is just uh, you know with stage it is increasing it can be a association but with the cd4 plus cells also and some of the immunity markers are also associated pdl1 yeah so is there any association between the microbiome and say pdl1 expert that we have not checked so yeah question when you are comparing these leukoplakia with the uh, gradually progression of oral cancer samples is there any unique uh, unique uh, signature of microbiome is differentiating between the leukoplakia normal no, so, and oscc no so interestingly those uh, cancer samples also have a at the same normal but they have got similar microbiome so yeah, no they have they have similar microbiome like the cancer so we didn't include them in the analysis because they don't make any sense you also check uh, the microbiome no that was only 16s it was a collaborative project not of our own lab so it was like somebody had an objective and we helped them to do it uh, may i ask one question uh, actually uh, i am working viral infections so in everyone know in chronic infection there is a exhaustion of immune cells mostly cd8 t cell and viral infection so any specific species which is associated with cd8 t cell exhaustion because we know their gut microbiota biome profile is difference between the uh, acute and chronic infection but any specific species which might leading to exhaustion or protecting with it uh, for yeah, the th th this is one of the uh, important things that we are also studying in some food ulcers with the difference of the microbiome between acute wounds that heal very easily and those wounds that don't heal so yeah i don't know i don't have any specific answer to it but yeah if others online or offline acute and pro pro chronic infections is there any signature microbial species that differentiates i think antibiotic resistant bacteria mrsa escape pathogens those are the answers but anyone i think you are asking more towards the healthy bacteria like the good ones if they are there or they are not there right or the the, the pathogenic ones yeah yeah we can say if these bacteria are mm -hmm. presence this patient may go for the chronicity because yeah. they have this signature so can yeah. we use a microbiome for the future biomarker something yeah. oh. actually that is a very active field and people are trying to do exactly that it's not evolved th this much yet but there are in like early life if you have bifidobacterium uh, flavobacteria then you know that child will be protected but it doesn't always happen but so that's some diabetic patients uh, show because done a st study which is there in the poster what we have found that those who have we all know in diabetic patients if they have any wound that gets longer time to heal now when we do the wound culture we find more and more mrsa when we do the mi microbiome we also find more and more mrsa so we found why from where this mrsa is coming then we took the, as we know staphylococcus aureus is more on the nasal cavity so we check the nasal uh, swab of diabetic patients those who don't have any food ulcer and then we check those individuals who are diabetic foot ulcer and they are nasal we found the nasal carriage is very high in diabetic individuals compared to the healthy 
and when the odds ratio we checked that what is the pro, you know pro, proportion of individuals having the nasal carriage of uh, uh, MRSA and having in the wound also it is odds, odds ratio is 4.2 it's very significant so yeah. the nasal carriage of that MRSA in diabetic patients are actually a risk factor that if you have a wound that will be more antibiotic re resistant than those individuals who don't have the MRSA in their wounds. So it's a characteristic of the immunocompromised condition of the, the diabetic patients. That yeah. those are, and these are all community acquired MRSA. We have the sequence and check. They are not hospital acquired from the OPD. A very you know concern and very dangerous thing is antibiotic resistance. resistance we can yeah. now move to antibiotic res re resistance and how microbiome uh, you know is, yeah. is uh, you know important in that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Hello. that's great. Yeah, and I would like to add something. Like rather than, uh, I would like to answer that uh, um, to what I understand from the various papers we have read and gone through. Like uh, rather than focusing on the individual uh, bacteria, we should uh, focus on the concept of eubiosis versus dysbiosis. So uh, that is more important. If there is a eubiosis, likelihood of the person or the patient progressing to the chronicity will be less. And if there is a dysbiosis, irrespective of whether this species or present or that species, it will be some species X, some species Y which will be there. But if there is a dysbiosis, likelihood of uh, higher inflammation, likelihood of progressing to a chronic disease would be more in those individuals. So yeah. there are different studies. Some have found one bacteria, some others have found the other. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. And I think also dysbiosis in gut and again the same thing, what happens in the tissue around that site is different. So of course what you're saying can be answered by looking at something around the tumor, but more general approach will be to look at the disc. But I wanted to quickly um, ask about, uh, sorry. So um, my question is actually associated with antibiotic resistance only. So there has been studies in cancer in cancer only and in many other uh, many other diseases where they show that you know uh, patients which had a better uh, which had a higher diversity uh, of gut microbiome has a better prognosis after the treatment and they have a less probability of developing sepsis or you know undergoing mortality but you know uh, still there are no specific people are not even although there have been studies from different countries and they have all come to the same conclusion but there's still no specific prognostic markers that have been identified yeah. which you know based on which where with, uh, before starting the treatment we can actually you know classify the individuals into a high risk and a low risk group yeah. why do you think that is because one thing is because the microbiome is so diverse Diversity. but i'm sure some commonalities must be there that is yeah. actually protective in nature yeah. for uh, the treatment process yeah, I totally agree Actually, and I think I what a... you are saying uh, holds very important in terms of what techniques we choose because right now whatever has been happening, there are like two different silos, microbiome people were working on the microbiome and then there is disease. So now people are starting to come together and bringing in the biomarker aspect of microbiome. So I think field is moving in that direction, but more people can pitch in into this. Yeah, yeah actually that's a very, uh, I have something uh, to elaborate on that. So uh, the, the I, uh, first thing is I want to clarify like uh, so one concept that there's a concept that diversity is good, specifically about the gut microbiome. Uh, from but but from the data that we have seen uh, in like I have seen or like we have seen uh, till date, diversity as a mark as a beneficial prognostic marker has just limited applic applicability. Like for for example in aging we see that uh, there was a there's a uh, there was a viewpoint that diversity decreases in disease many of the diseases the diversity decreases but it, that's not the case when we actually look into the data it's only for some disorders like antibiotic treatment or like uh, inflammation we see the diversity going down but for many other diseases we don't see the diversity actually going down it is it is mostly based on it is, the, the, the actual marker is a set of like uh, what you mentioned actual marker is a actual markers are a set of taxa it's not a single taxa, it's a set of taxa, which we can, which we refer to by different names. We call, call them as the keystones, we call them as the, the core of the microbiome, we call them as the putative beneficial uh, taxa of the microbiome. And these taxa generally, they occur as a, as a guild, or like a, a few guilds. 
uh, like they tend to co-occur together and there are subgroups within that. And these subgroups, they vary across different geographies. So if you have, if you move from a completely tri tribal environment to industrialized environment, you will see a Primotella, Gemiger, uh, Iso, uh, uh, Gemiger, Primotella, Oscillibacter going down. And you'll see a Bacteroides, Acromantia, Parabacteroides guild coming up. So they take over each other's role depending on the environment or depending on the, how the host lifestyle is. But they, 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 what they do is they typically substitute each other's function in a manner that is adjusted with the host. And that is exactly what we are trying to do in our group right now. We, our hypothesis has been like the microbiome is essentially like community. It's not a single taxa that determines. It is essentially like a community and this community has an inherent ranking order. So they become like, like you have a village, right? There's a, there's a hierarchy of how the village is arranged. And we are, and so that's what we are trying to understand. Like we, we are trying to actually quantify every uh, different species. We are looking to around 190 species and we are trying to actually quantify the hierarchy of these species onto the microbiome by investigating different properties. We're looking into longitudinal yes. data, looking into which species are associated with stability. We're looking into health data, looking like which species are generally associated with disease. We're looking into the, uh, different statistical techniques to compute the influence of these taxa on the other members of the microbiome. So these we are calling as the like the core keystones or the binders of the microbiome. And it is the loss of these binders that we see are the most strongly associated with disease rather than the overall diversity itself, like the phylogenetic diversity or the Shannon diversity, whatever we use yeah, it. Sorry. It's not the overall diversity. It's yeah. the diversity of a specific yes. member or a specific sets of the microbiome. Thank you. Thanks, so, so Bridges, you have raised your hand. Bridges. Hello. Uh, this is Anushri actually. Uh, Anushri, okay. So from Elvi Prasad Institute, uh, we work on the ocular surface microbiome, which is very small actually. Uh, compared to gut and then skin, uh, the microbiome uh, diversity is very uh, small. Uh, that I would I would like to uh, tell over here. Uh, what I want to say is I totally agree with the earlier uh, speaker who has spoke about the microbiome and then how the gills are formed and all those things. We have observed similar findings even on the ocular surface microbiome. So uh, when we looked at the microbiome in healthy versus the disease condition, we see uh, totally no difference in the alpha diversity at all, indicating that. Uh, the diversity is has not changed, but the composition has changed de definitely. The overall composition has definitely changed. And then we, uh, what we observed is in healthy conditions, we observed guild for the probiotic bacteria like lactobacillus. While in uh, inflammatory condition, we observed uh, guilds for the uh, pro-inflammatory bacteria like uh, Privetella. And uh, in infectious conditions, we saw gills were the opportunistic pathogens. That is what I wanted to come. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we can. Yeah. Another person has put up hand. So, Shantanuda, please be short. We have to uh, talk about something else. Please be short. Yeah. Simply, I just want to mention that although diversity matters, I also agree to the person who said whether or not some of the bacteria can be used as a prognostic marker. I would say yes. In certain cases, some of the uh, bacteria should be used as a marker and their number. For example, for gastric cancer, definitely I am in favor of putting bifidobacterium number as a prognostic marker. Uh, it, of course, depends yeah. on the which disease. Uh, lactobacillus, for example, I did not find any effect, but bifidobacterium, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's like, totally uh, there I is an inherent it. rank order in the microbiome. And this Sorry? rank order of, uh, I also agree with Santanuda, like there is an inherent rank order of the microbiome. Correct. For example, Correct. To the gut, the top is always fecal bacterium. No matter what analysis you do, you get fecal bacterium, pralsin at the top. Uh, the the, the other bacteria. point, Tadini, at young age, we all have high bifidobacteria count. Yeah. But yes. when and for the infants, we, it is always it. Yeah, and, longer. And, uh, Let me see. Shantanu, we, we can yeah, ca carry on this uh, yeah. discussion uh, after this meeting. Yeah, so. I think it depends on the context and we all agree that sometimes taxa are combined together or sometimes like just the individual species. Um, I wanted to move on to the next topic. Can you put yes, this? Yeah. 
um, low biomass microbiome. Anyone is working on samples or tissues or like age group where the microbiome is really low biomass and what kind of techniques we can use to actually study accurately those microbes. Low biomass microbiome. See, I Hello. can say... Uh, uh, sorry, I we, have a, we have a person speaking in the room later. After the offline sure, sure, speakers, sure. we will go to the online speakers. Yeah. Please raise your hand and keep the hands raised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I've worked on a crypt-associated microbiota population. So, uh, the intestinal crypts were basically uh, considered to be sterile regions uh, till a couple of years back. And recently, papers have come up where mice and human crypts have been shown to harbor very small populations of bacteria. So I have studied the uh, microbiota population in these crypts between patients with ulcerative colitis and healthy controls. And uh, the technique uh, that I can support that I've done in my thesis is that you can scoop these crypts out of the uh, mucosal tissues using laser capture micro dissection. And uh, there are Arcturus kits available which can isolate DNA from very very small, up to uh, maybe 10 cells or so. And uh, these cells can then perhaps be used for whole metagenome or 16S sequencing. Okay. So techniques like laser capture micro dissection can really help. Okay, so laser capture micro dissection is one. And, okay. yeah. and the second one? Motion has raised it. Okay. It's on. Hello? Hello? So, uh, as uh, my PhD is on vaginal microbiome, but I also work on the placental microbiome. Yeah, then so, you know. <laughs> as some, there is two school of thought. Some believe placenta has microbiome and some believe placenta is completely sterile. So, I do have collected some of the placental samples. So, every step is crucial for the low biomass of samples. Yeah. Because if there is so less uh, microbiome is there, so yeah. we have to very much... Uh, take care of the environment controls, yeah. negative controls, because we are wearing gloves, we are uh, uh, using instrument, scissor, every, every yeah. tissue paper and BSL2 yeah. where we are working. Yeah. So maybe some, some contamination can, can come to the sample also. Yeah. But even nowadays, uh, the DNA isolation kit also has their own microbiome. Yeah. So every step is crucial to uh, negate out the negative control. Yeah. So still, uh, if we negate out the the possible contamination, still uh, we can find the lit uh, microbiome is there. So, but uh, if I can say for the placenta, if some bacteria is truly obligate anaerobic, then we can say yes, it came from the placenta. But it is, if it is the, uh, uh, the facultative anaerobic, but then we can't say it is from the placenta only. So there is so much things yeah. that need to be uh, yeah. Thought. So you want to okay. say that the negative controls have to be adjusted. Yes, and the negative controls choice are also has to be made very judicious. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, so now uh, Dr. Rupak has raised hand. Yeah. So uh, I work on skin microbiome and you know um, it is also a very low biomass microbiome. And uh, Shovik and I both collaborated on this. So I do agree that you have to be careful, have the right control, because you can understand a skin microbiome, when you are sampling a skin microbiome, the environment is always around you. You cannot escape that. Yeah. So when I do a skin microbiome analysis, I probably have more, more controls than my real experiments. Yeah. And I, I try to do it in such a way that I pool samples from a single individual, I sample similar spots side by side and I pull samples to do it. And I just want to point out one more thing as you were talking previously about diversity and everything. One more, one interesting point is that we all have, have acne on our face. So if you study acne microbiome, you will not see a change in the diversity of the microbiome. Another example where di change in diversity is not present, but it is the functional nature of the acne isolates that causes your micro or causes your acne breakup. Okay. So these are my uh, two uh, uh, two cents uh, working on skin microbiome for quite a long time, uh, maybe a decade now. Okay. 
Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I, I will add to it as Shanko uh, can uh, say because he is the one who, who collects all the samples for doing his PhD. Uh, what the struggle is that we may have collected lots and lots of samples for the psoriasis or atopic dermatitis, lesional skin swabs. We can do 16 minutes from that. But when we want to do shotgun sequencing or metatranscriptomics, we can't get many samples. And then even if we do sh shotgun, suppose we collect 70 samples of which only 11 can do, be done shotgun sequencing because the skin swab has to have a particular concentration of the microbiome for it to be carried forward for uh, shotgun sequencing. That's the struggle with the skin. Yeah, Shankar. Yes. So, uh, so uh, we are doing skin microbiome for long, right? So we are doing it from for actually or for more than 10 years now. So what happens is like if we collect almost 100 samples, almost 50 to 60 percent samples of them are actually are then qualified for the shotgun because shotgun essentially needs one nanogram of DNA in total. But oftentimes the DNA quality from the skin microbiome samples after isolated after isolation, it comes very low in the qubit and all. So the thing is, uh, we have to we have we have already we had already standardized our DNA our, our sample collection procedure because we have to. Uh, we have to cover a certain area of our skin to cover a particular diameter of area of our, from our skin that then only we can actually we are able to collect a right full amount of microbiome DNA from that those samples and also after collecting the DNA uh, we have some standardization in the uh, DNA after uh, DNA concentration uh, increase increasement of the DNA concentration like we can incorporate steps like speed back because after doing speed vac, we can actually essentially increase the amount of DNA before uh, proce proceeding for the NGS. So there are many standardization process requires to actually uh, actually get actually get the samples proper for the NGS after collecting after de isolating the DNA for microbiome from skin samples. So, so many steps are required actually. So the yeah. main solution is if you can collect the biopsies from the skin of the lesional skin of the patients. That is okay, but the healthy individuals will not give you any skin biopsies. Yes, that is so you can't com compare then cases versus controls. Yeah. That's and, the bottom and there are Yeah, I think the bottom so, line... Rijesh was uh, talking about I. Rijesh, yes. Or Anushri. Yeah. Hello, we yeah, are Anushri here. So we also work on very low biomass uh, microbiome actually. Yeah. So the ocular surface microbiome. And then the microbiome uh, sampling sites are different for different diseases as well as uh, depending on the type of project also. We collect sample of uh, tear sample, uh, conjectural swabs as well as intraocular fluids. All these samples are very uh, low in quantity as well as low in biomass. So that is the um, challenge we face over here to get the actual microbiome from uh, uh, these individuals. So that is what. Is there, is so there we struggle a lot. Yeah. Is yes. Is there any particular approach you like more than the other, or any advice? So uh, actually, we uh, same like earlier speaker uh, uh, spoke. Uh, we also use feedback to concentrate the sample as well as the whenever we get the DNA. Also, we try to concentrate it and then further go for the next step. That is what we do. Okay, so I think the bottom line is that low biomass samples are very prone to contamination. So that should be taken care of. And I totally agree. Like in my study, we had 10 times more controls than the samples that we had. And most of the money went into the control sequencing. But it is what it is. You can't prove microbiome in low biomass samples unless you have right control. The next thing I think um, we can move forward to because we don't have much time, I think, is... So when we are... Yeah, it's coming here, right? So when we are talking about microbiome, Again, there is gut microbiome, there is tissue microbiome, but collectively combined together, how we can use it to devise strategies for healthcare initiatives or to use it for, um, um, I mean, vaccine adjuvants or therapy, something like that. So if anybody's working in that direction, would be good to, to hear that. 
Okay, so the question is that using the knowledge from the microbiome, how we can use it and what all aspects it can be used for therapeutics, for biomarker discovery, translational aspects. One example, which is a very good example, is that uh, rabies vaccine, it is uh, conjugated with, the, um, I think, certain, um, uh, certain species or certain genera of microbes and retinoic acid. And it actually enhances the efficacy of the, of the vaccine or uh, some drugs they are given along with the, um, the probiotics or certain microbiome combined. So something like that if anybody is working on. Yeah. Any idea in this room? Biotherapeutics, the potential of the microbiome. Yeah. So I think here, I see if you have oh, somebody is there. Sorry. First, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So uh, in our project, we have done fecal microbiota transplantation, which is a pretty well-known therapeutic for yeah. modulating microbiome these days. But I understand in certain areas of the world, FMT is prohibited because of yeah. its negative effects. So um, one direction that we're working towards now is to, since we've performed metabolomics of mucosa associated and fecal microbiome. So the next li uh, in line uh, is designing of a me metabolite cocktail that is produced yeah. by these bacteria yeah. or fungi, yeah. for instance, short-chain fatty acids or AHR ligands, which are known to have uh, anti-inflammatory yeah. effects in patients with IBD, at least, and other diseases as well. Yeah. So metabolite cocktails can be one of the future, future forward, directions yeah. for FMT. Yeah, so it's basically symbiotics, which are combined with, yeah, that's a good idea and that's a good aspect to move forward to. Somebody else? Actually, this metabolite thing, uh, you know, producing a metabolite cocktail and, you know, giving it is a very well established technique in plants where, uh, you know, they give it to the soil to improve the fertility and yield. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, the, the online uh, yeah. candidates now. <clears throat> Tarimi. Yeah, so, so I, I also agree with Manakshani. So, the, pri the primary aspect of microbiome i feel right now is is three prong first is as a diagnostic like predicting your risk for a certain disease second is as uh, as a as a as a stratifier like whether you can you, will, you are going to respond to a certain therapy you are going to respond to diet or you are going to respond to a certain probiotic as well the third and the most vital thing is what uh, Manishwini also identified, uh, mentioned that once we do this kind of large analysis of data like meta-analysis and we find some candidates, validate them uh, functionally using organoids or using mice models and then if you identify specific metabolites, we can actually give them as, as postbiotics or symbiotic uh, supplementations for as, as, a, as a therapy. Thanks, Tarini. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the same yeah, this time it's me, Sovik. Thanks. So, as a doctor, this is a very important question for me, and diabetes mellitus has been my area of research. You know, whenever I look at this, I am like, give me something which can identify first that this person is at a risk for a problem. So, Tarani was mentioning about diagnostic and you know, biomarkers. That's the first thing. So, for a long time, we have been uh, conceptualizing this index which can pick up people at risk for diabetes mellitus or even its consequences like diabetic retinopathy. So we are essentially looking at a very cheap test which can be deployed across, you know, targeted populations which are known to be at risk. Slowly, slowly work and convince and advocate and convince your uh, policy makers and actually get it inside the insurance systems itself so that at a particular age, a particular population must get itself screened for this kind of a problem. And, and once you are able to, you know, identify this link between uh, the presence and the cause and the effect, then we talk about supplementing therapy for people at risk and making it mandatory. You know, pregnant people, we will mandatorily will give them some kind of supplements. Similarly, make it mandatory for those kind of populations to take those kind of supplements and then 10 years later check whether the burden of disease has gone down or not. So this is something which is a dream. I hope someday we succeed at it. Thank you, Rajesh. Yeah. yeah. I would like to add something, uh, uh, Dr. Sumit Rawat here. So, I have some clinical uh, real-life situation experiences. Uh, like many patients of uh, GERD are coming to me, gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. So, uh, with those patients, uh, along with the, the standard therapy, what we did, uh, we have advised these patients natural probiotics. 
not uh, the uh, artificial or the commercially available ones. Natural uh, probiotics such as sauerkraut, uh, kefir, and if, if this is not available, uh, we advise them natural curd and other fermented foods. So uh, many studies also say that uh, it helps in regulating your uh, natural uh, yeah. parasympathetic and uh, uh, your uh, gut uh, physiology. Yeah. So uh, uh, if we compare with the other people, although it's not a published data yet, but if we compare with the other people taking standard therapy versus those who are taking more of uh, this uh, fermented foods, definitely they have a very uh, quicker and a very a sustained response uh, in uh, cases of uh, improvement in the symptoms of the disease and uh, sustained response. That's it. Thank you. So I think that could be partly, uh, it's true that uh, taking pure curd or pure uh, things helps in terms of microbiome. But one reason could be that we are still in very early stages of understanding microbiome and we don't know what exactly from that microbiota affects or helps. We are trying to do a lot of um, if and buts here, but we still don't know that. So the potential is not um, unlocked yet. I think we'll sum it up because it's quite getting quite late and I'll just talk about um, the final thing that uh, the whole point of having this breakout session was to bring people together and just know what others are doing, what kind of samples they are using, what kind of techniques they are using, and how we can collaborate with each other. So one doesn't have to do everything alone, everything in their own settings, and use money where it is. So sometimes there is money, but not sample and stuff like that. So I think that's with that idea in mind, let's remember each other and talk to each other, write to each other, and also beyond this room because you have uh, listened to the talks outside. And um, yeah, I think keep the, keep the mojo high for microbiome research. There's a lot to do in this field. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much. Joining, uh, Meghna, you you didn't say anything. <laughs> I did put my hand up for the low biomass samples, but then we moved on to the next point, so I lowered it. <laughs> Just say about your experience in low low biomass. We we want to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I work at the Forensic Institute, and we often deal with very low biomass samples. Um, it's also a it's also an issue that we are, it's an ongoing issue. However, some of our collaborators do use host depletion strategies. So there you um, specifically lyse human cells and increase the bacterial load. And that does seem to help. However, it does kind of skew the microbiome composition a little bit. So it depends on the goal, but that could be a te technique that might be helpful in some cases. That's a great suggestion, actually. We are also doing that in spatial transcriptomics. So we are trying to deplete mm. the host because there's a lot of host, and then looking at the microbiome. That is actually giving some good yes, results, yes. but yeah. I think something we didn't uh, elaborate upon is the, is the single cell microbiome sequencing. So in the morning when I just searched the internet on single cell microbiome sequencing, I found they are mostly in the review stage, some reviews, some futuristic things, microfluidics and other kinds of things are happening. Some studies have happened, but those are with single, single bacteria. But from the microbiome, how you do single cell, so that's not by culture only, that's by some fluidics. Like, like you do this emulsion, PCR and all for NGS, they have these uh, flu fluidic apparatus by which these microbiome can be made into single, single bacteria. Now the mo most important part is if this is anaerobic ba bacteria, that will be a problem because then you have to also adjust that that has to be in a low oxygen environment. So there are some reviews and other kinds of things and I think the human cell atlas should also start thinking on uh, incorporating this single cell microbiome sequencing yeah. and how these can be, the training is important too. Yeah. More than the dry lab, as we see that the problem is always in the dry lab. But now I think the la the laboratory part, that is also very challenging here. We yeah. don't have those kinds of things in yeah. India to fall back upon. Yeah. So the training, the handholding is also required in when, when we will do the yeah. experiment in the lab. Yeah. With this, I think we should end in a futuristic uh, 
think that uh, yeah, someday some of us in this room or maybe all of us in this room, we will not only be collaborating on host single cell and microbiome uh, you know, interactions, but also start doing single cell microbiome se sequence. That may open up a new area and uh, some new inferences can come and this cause yeah. effect problem can also be solved. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You can come here. So if we want to explore the tumor microbiome and we have the biopsy samples. So one thing what I'm understanding is that we will be, we will be doing the genomics to find out the microbial signature. Now adding on that, if we want to functionalize that, so if we want to culture that particular bacterial signature, then what shall be our approach? So will be the biopsy sample being divided into two parts, one will go for the genomics part and another part should come to the lab. I think more than the genomics, we should, if we collect samples now, hmm. if these are stored samples that we have to do genomics on. But if we are collecting samples now, we should go beyond gen genomics and do metatranscriptomics. To okay. know that the bacteria is viable or not, is the gene expression happening or not. That will help you to take an another part and to uh, an anaerobically uh, focus on that particular bacteria that is viable rather than the entire uh, microbiome which may, be, may not be viable also. So in that context, the live samples will be much more uh, utilizing, or will be helpful in that. I think study design part is the, 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 the most important thing in microbiome research, how you collect sam samples. That can change your inference. How samples are collected, how samples are, you know, uh, you know experimented in the lab, those are the very important things. Because in dry lab, you will analyze whatever you get from the wet lab. So in wet lab, how you are bringing the samples, how you are storing the samples, how you are doing the experiment, that's very important in microbiome studies. Particularly low biomass mm -hmm. microbiome, like inherent within the cells, in tissues, those kinds of things. Okay. Cart and all is okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>